Hello everyone, welcome to another 320 sim pilot video and today we're going to take a look at auto landing the Tolist Airbus A321 in X-Plane 11. I did a recent video looking at Microsoft Flight Simulator's A320 Neo where we tried to auto land it in a few different places with some mixed results and today let's have a look at how the Tolist handles uh, auto landing and we'll also look at some of the things we will set up in uh, a typical Airbus flight where we are expecting to auto land and what sort of things we are looking for. As always, this is not for any real world use, it's just for our use in uh, X-Plane and hopefully we'll give you some extra context on what we do with the real aircraft. So let's get started. Today we're going to make our first approach into Copenhagen onto runway 22 left. We'll be flying an ILS to cat 3 minima, so as you can see outside the windows here we're at 5,000 feet and it is a uh, foggy day so you get this sort of low stratusy sort of cloud layer just sitting above the ground which is uh, quite a common situation. Often in uh, foggy days like this you have light winds, uh, it's typically in the morning or early evening uh, as the dew point reaches the same temperature as the ambient temperature and the air can no longer hold all the water that's in it so some of that water condenses and forms these clouds and uh, fog around the ground. So let's uh, jump into the flight deck and get ourselves set up. So far I've already set up my FMGC to an extent, so if you need help with that I do have a video on setting up the FMGC for an approach, but essentially what I can show you now is simply what I've done. So in the flight plan page I've got a route that takes us back around and as you can see here we're going to fly in and fly the ILS 2 to left into Copenhagen Echo Kilo Charlie Hotel. Performance page is loaded in and as I said calm winds are expected 15 degrees I don't know that that could happen, uh, I'm not sure what temperature it might be, uh, but that's just what it is today. QNH1213, and uh, we're going to do a flat fall auto land. The Airbus is a very capable aircraft. It can land, auto land, flap 3, flap full, it can do it on one engine. There are different limitations to all of these things, so it can't always do um, uh, approaches like that. For example, in a strong crosswind, you may not be able to do a single engine auto land, things like that. But today, in this sort of conditions, typically uh, it's got a crosswind limit of almost uh, 20 knots uh, and maybe even a tailwind limit of up to 10 knots. It does depend on the aircraft and the, the modifications on it. But we've got a, a calm wind today, which like I say is quite common for foggy days. Maybe a light tailwind sometimes. So now let's look at the minima. So as I said, I've got the weather set right down onto the limits and I'm going to show you that now if I go here weather and we've got um, a runway visual range let's reduce that to 96 meters RVR so that RVR is talking about the runway visual range which is not normal visibility because normal visibility is just what you're expected to be able to see through the air um, but RVR is what you're expected to be able to see along the runway lights so we have to have specific equipment on the ground available to us which this runway does um, you can actually see it on the chart here HIALS high intensity approach lighting system um, so we should be able to see a bit further on the runway than the actual visibility so uh, it totally depends but for example if your visibility the visibility in the airport was reported as something like 300 meters in fog your RVRs might be a bit higher maybe 400 meters because you can see the lights through the fog um, but because it's so bad, we can't actually do a CAT 2 ILS um, because we require an RVR of 300 meters and we haven't got that. Um, and they've got a CAT 3A option here, um, as well as a CAT 3B minimum RVR 75 meters. So that's all we're going to need because the Airbus is CAT 3B capable. So let's put in uh, 75 meters, which means we don't need a decision height. If we were doing a CAT 3A approach, we would need to put in 50 which would go as a height. It has to be a height, there's no altitude option here. There is uh, an altitude option for um, CAT 2, so 108, which would go in MDA, because that's your altitude above the ground. Uh, sorry, above sea level, MDA, so it's 108 feet above sea level, 101 feet above the ground. But we're gonna have no decision height for our CAT 3B, so I'm gonna put no in there. And now on the PFT, when we activate the approach phase, it will say no DH, uh, which is fine. Flat ball landing, as I said, we've got the thrust reduction acceleration page for the go around all set. If you're coming to this video from Microsoft Flight Simulator, a few of these features aren't currently working in the A320neo, but uh, they will be um, slowly added, I think, by the modding team who are working on it. There that. we go, we have no decision height set up in the FMGC for our uh, CAT 
3B auto lands. There are different IVR requirements. Low visibility opts is a whole topic on its own and it would make for a very long video. Um, it takes quite a lot of extra training for flight crews to be qualified for low vis procedures. It is actually an additional part of your license uh, in most uh, countries. So you'll be qualified to fly the aircraft and then you'll need an extra qualification to use it in low visibility procedures. It's also important that our aircraft is qualified. So that means typically on the Airbus checking the status page and it could come up with a message saying CAT3 in op or CAT2 in op. The Airbus is able to auto land even if for example CAT3 was in op it could auto land CAT2 typically um, and things like that so there are different ways it can downgrade. So what are we going to do about our approach? Well we can fly the ILS like we normally would um, in this case that means we're going to fly out and around inset the ILS uh, and arm the approach push button like normal. Once I've done that, I'm going to engage the second autopilot because you want to have both of them running at the same time. That way they can take over for each other if one fails. Also, when we are both, we will be able to do a CAT3 dual approach, which is the best standard that the Airbus can fly. It could also do CAT3 single, uh, which would mean that it couldn't do a CAT3B approach. So today, because we're doing the lowest minima, we're flying all the way down to CAT3B, we need it to say CAT3 dual. If we were only doing CAT3A, so uh, 50 feet decision height, then we could actually do it um, with one autopilot. Uh, but we would still choose to do two. You'll always use two, even for uh, Cat 1 approaches, just to have the backup ready. As you can see, to do the Cat 3A approach, we also need 200 meters RVR, um, which we don't have today. So something you would be considering for flying a low visibility approach like this is what do we do if uh, our aircraft does downgrade? And by downgrade, I mean go from Cat 3 dual to Cat 3 single or to Cat 2 even. Can we continue the approach? Well, today, because we know our minima is below 200 meters, we can't. Uh, we don't have that choice. Uh, in real flying, you actually have a height. It's around about 1,000 feet above the runway for a lot of airlines. Um, and at that height, you need to uh, have decided what you're going to do if you're going to continue the approach. And if you go through that height, uh, you can only continue below it uh, in the event that the RVRs are good enough for your approach. We also look at RVRs all along the runway, but I won't talk about that today. We're just thinking in general the RVRs, because in Flight Simulator we can't set specific ones. But we actually count uh, different points along the runway. There's three different points on the runway, typically, where they'll um, measure the RVRs, and then you have to have each one where you need it. Right, so um, that's a, a lot of talking. Like I say, there's, it's a huge topic, uh, low visibility procedures. But let's go and fly the approach and see how the aircraft should behave. If you've seen the Autoland video in Microsoft Flight Simulator, you'll know roughly what we're expecting to happen. But I'm hoping it will say Cat 3 Dual and no decision height up here in the FMA column. And then by 350 feet radult, when I'm fully configured on final approach, I'm expecting it to change to uh, land in green up here. Then by 30 feet I want it to say flare, at which point it will raise the nose. It will also idle the thrust in the flare, but at 10 feet red out I'm expecting it to say retard, which is what meaning retard the thrust levers. So it's a reminder, it should have already brought the thrust to idle, it will command thrust idle, and then at 10 feet it will remind me to close the thrust levers, so it's an instruction, not a... Um, uh, in a normal landing it just says that to make sure you remember to do it by touchdown but in an auto land it's an instruction so when it says it I will bring these to idle uh, and then it should touch down at touchdown I'm expecting it to change to roll out uh, by nose wheel touchdown at which point it should roll out down the runway for us so let's give it a go just to prove to you it has worked I've now activated the approach phase it's now got the OXS 1095 tuned in it says course 219 which is a bit odd i would expect it to to be correct but sometimes i've seen this happen so um, we'll just leave it as it is i know the fmgc is correct but there we go so the rls is set up in there and now the pfd says no dh which is as expected so we're going to descend into the gloom uh, for our approach okay so around about now i would expect to have been cleared for the approach we're turning in using nav mode which is fine and once I'm pointing in towards the airport I will arm the approach push button. You can of course use localizer first and then it will capture the localizer and then arm approach but uh, there's no reason if you're not cleared or if you are cleared with the approach we can just press approach. So there we go and I get glycope and lock blue and you can see it says cat 3 single up here. So that is all we are at the moment because we're using one autopilot. So if one autopilot is broken that's all you can use. There's lock star. 
But I'm going to engage the second autopilot and you can see it's changed to Cat 3 Dual and it tells me autopilot 1 plus 2. So now if we have another failure of one of these autopilot systems it will actually warn us and give us that triple click noise where it's reverting. It's, it's telling me that the capability of the aircraft is changing. So we want to intercept the glide slope. So we want to slow down a little bit so I'm going to go to flaps to 1. We're in managed speed of course so it's slowing down for us. And what you'll also um, notice is there's this button here, which is actually the auto land warning light. It doesn't seem to be functioning in the, in the TOLIS. Um, so I'll talk about that shortly. Let's put out flaps two. And then we'll start down the glide slope. The Garand altitude was worth checking. I will just check this. I think it's 3,000 feet. There it is. So glide slope start. The Garand altitude of 3,000 feet is in, and now we'll carry on down the ILS. So this red light here, which doesn't light up sadly, I wonder if I test it, can it? Can we get it to display? Yes it does, it's auto land. What that'll light up for on the aircraft is uh, if there is a problem below 200 feet it becomes active, 200 feet rad out, which will be uh, above the ground, it's the radio altimeter. If it becomes active and lights up, it's telling me that the aircraft is not capable as we're expecting it to be and we will go around. It is a, a mandatory go around. The Airbus using both autopilots, so with this Cat 3 dual situation, autopilot 1 plus 2, is capable of continuing even with a failure. But the problem is that only is applicable as you get very low down. So the auto land will only light up if the failure is serious enough that we need to go around. So we will obey it because it means there's a problem. But when you're Cat 3 dual, it's called fail active, which means we can lose one of the autopilots, for example, and the aircraft can continue and land. If we are Cat 3 single, we don't have that option. We're fail passive, which means that we cannot continue with a, a failure. Uh, the aircraft won't manage to auto land. So that's something we have to account for. Right, let's configure then. So gear comes down, arm the speed brakes or spoilers for landing. Put on these lights, they should be on. And what's the temperature? It's 14 degrees. Let's go to flaps three. I do like the sound effects. The sound effects of the BSS sound pack, which is uh, really nice. And we'll ding the cabin. Okay. And now this is a typical view on a really uh, low vis day. If it was nighttime, you may even consider turning off some of the lights because you want to be able to see out to the runway. But we actually don't need to see anything. No decision height means we can land without seeing anything at all. We just require 75 meters RVR, and that's just part of the rollout and taxi requirements. If your requirement was 200 meters or you're doing a cat 3a approach then there are some requirements there's some lights you'll need to see on vinyl approach and that sort of thing so as we know we're sitting at sort of 90 meters rvr uh, that's what i've set in x plane so it will be interesting to see what we actually get to see out the window but this is quite typical of a, a low vis approach where you'll just see nothing all the way down So we're below a thousand feet now, we've still got the RBR we require, 75 meters, it's still good enough. Air traffic will typically tell you on uh, approach at some point before a thousand feet just to make sure that you can continue with your approach. Like I say, if we were doing a Cat 3 single approach, which would be a Cat 3A landing, then uh, we would require this 200 meters RBR uh, and we wouldn't be able to continue below a thousand unless we had that required minimum. Okay, so land mode has engaged by 350 red up, which is correct. Next, I want to see it say flare by 30 feet. Then we'll see it uh, go into rollout mode. Like I say, we're not expecting to see much out the window at all. So let's see what happens. If we don't get the flare mode, we will go around. See the runway coming up now, the ground level being shown on the PFT. There's flare, thrust idle commanded. Retard instruction, thrust levers to idle. There's touchdown, and rollout mode before nose will touch down. Let's bring the reverses out. So reverse is coming to green, spoilers are up, and it's deselling. And it's rolling out as well for us, so it's keeping us on that center line. 70 knots there, reverses are already at uh, reverse idle, so that's fine and we'll let it take it slow and as you can see there is very poor visibility down the runway so taxiing now can be a challenge 
you need good runway lights, which actually we have here, so we can see to vacate. So let's release those auto brakes. And we are down to taxi speed. And there we go. Reverses to idle. And let's bring it to a stop. And set the power brake. Right, let's go and have a look at that uh, in some other conditions. Now I want to show you a similar approach in the same place. I'm going to keep it simple. We'll stay in uh, Copenhagen and this time we'll do a bit of a crosswind and I'll increase the visibility just so we can see what the airplane is doing. So hopefully that first approach gave you an idea of uh, what a typical Cat 3 foggy landing might be like with the flight crew. Uh, and now let's go and try and see how the autopilot handles in the TOLIS. Hopefully you saw there how serious the monitoring has to be of the aircraft. So although an auto land sounds like it's a nice idea uh, because the airplane does it for us, the reality is it takes a lot of concentration, a lot of focus to make sure that the aircraft is doing the right thing and that you are ready to abandon the approach at any point if you need to during it. So uh, it's not something to be taken uh, lightly, it's a very serious thing to be doing because we have to be watching that aircraft like a hawk to be ready to take over or intervene if required. If it does all uh, start to mess up, you can go around of course. Uh, and if you have the visual requirements, so for example if the weather is actually quite nice and you were just auto landing for practice and the airplane isn't doing what you like, it may be an option that you could take over and land yourself, things like that. So let's have a look in some crosswinds. So this time we have a bit of a crosswind, it's 140 at 16. So I'm just going to enter that into the approach phase, 140 at 16. Uh, and we'll stick with the same minimum because we have this option. Uh, so the runway is capable of it. You'll find that airports won't always be ready for low visibility approaches. So you can't just show up and then decide to do one, for example, if it suddenly goes foggy. The airport will actually need to set some things up. They'll have to make sure there's no equipment in the way, but in protections in place and this sort of thing. So it's not always as simple as just we can just choose the minima. We also need the airport to put in protections. The reason is if a big airplane or a truck taxis, for example, near the uh, transmitter for the localizer, say a ground vehicle, um, we can't trust that localizer it could distort and things like that so it might be fine for a normal ILS but it won't be fine for a low visibility one because of course as you saw there during the rollout the aircraft is using the localizer guidance to can stay on that center line because the localizer is actually on the other end of the runway so if I zoom in a bit um, the localizer is at this end of the runway it's the opposite end um, and that, that's how we can follow it all the way along while we're rolling out so that's just something to be aware of so here we go now on final approach and this time we have our crosswind uh, about 1, 4, 5, 16 knots it will be eventually and expecting the exact same thing from the aircraft. So it should go into uh, flare mode like normal uh, and all we'll see this time hopefully is a bit of rudder input where it will straighten out to the drift. The real aircraft does do this quite well, I've seen it do it um, in uh, over 15 knots of crosswind. There are some different limitations, some aircraft will be 15 knots crosswind for the rollout um, and some will be 15 for landing and that sort of thing. But today we're just going to keep it simple. Um, so it's typically a 20 knot crosswind on uh, the Airbus for an auto land. Here we go then, coming visual and you can see we are drifting so we are pointing to the left uh, and the actual track is slightly to the right. So there's about uh, I don't know, 6 degrees of drift at the moment. Let's go and see what happens. For an approach like this, uh, although we're doing a Cat 3 dual, no decision height, we could have downgraded. So if the airplane told us it had a problem and it went to Cat 3 single, we could have changed the minimum and carried on the approach as long as we did that uh, in time. Airlines will have different policies on where they want that done by, um, but it just gives you more flexibility. So you always want to try and use the lowest minimum available to you. But of course, to use minima this low requires low visibility procedures to be enforced and that sort of thing at the airport. OK, 
Okay, so looking good now. We're waiting for our 350 feet land FMA to appear. 500. We are already visual, so um, we can actually carry on and land uh, visually. The RVRs are better than Cat 1, so it's all, all good. There we go, land. So I'm not going to do anything to the rudder. I'm just going to bring the thrust levers to idle when it, I hear the words uh, retard from the computer. Now you can start to see that uh, crab sure. angle it's sometimes called. So we are pointing slightly left of the runway center line, which is good. Flare. Retard. Touchdown, spoilers, reverses, and decel. And there it is, rolling out. And I've still done nothing, the autopilot is still engaged, and it's trying to follow this localizer, which as I said, is down here on the uh, runway. And it's done a great job, so you saw it put the rudder in. That was probably a tiny bit more aggressive than I would expect to see the rudder done by the, uh, the actual aircraft, but there we go. And now we are rolling out and time to vacate. So down at taxi speed, I'm going to put the reverses to idle. And you'll notice that the autopilots remain engaged. So I'm going to release the brakes and roll forwards. Ah, they've disconnected. So in the real aircraft, these will actually stay engaged until somebody disconnects them. So it's possible to use, if you try to steer off the runway using the nozzle steering tiller, um, and you forget to disconnect the autopilot, then you will find that the autopilot will try and uh, pull you back onto the runway center line <laughs> if you let go of the tiller. Um, so that's something that's easy to forget if you do an automatic rollout. There are some situations where you may fly an automatic approach and landing, but you'll need to do a manual rollout. So you'll disconnect it uh, once you've touched down and roll out yourself. That could be in a runway degradation. So for example, a slippery sort of runway, maybe the aircraft doesn't quite have the capability. So for example, uh, you've had a technical malfunction, something like that. But there you go. So that was two different approaches and landings in the uh, tow list to show you what sort of things we're looking for in an auto land and how the aircraft uh, should behave. And I must say, this is an amazing, amazing simulation uh, for a home flight simulator. I, I just think it's brilliant. That's all these FMA changes are, are spot on. Even the thrust idle commands there um, comes at uh, just the right moment. So yeah, really impressed with that. So here's a replay of that uh, landing in the crosswind. Just a quick summary to start uh, wrapping up basics of doing an auto land in the Airbus. As you saw, it takes a bit of extra time to prepare. We need to think about some extra things such as is our aircraft ready to fly the approach? Are the crew ready? And is the airport capable? Have we set up the minima from the chart? Which minima are we going to use? We're going to use both autopilots to fly down the ILS, so select both of those once you're on approach. Monitor your FMAs carefully, very important. We need to have 350 feet land, 30 feet flare. Be prepared to intervene. You may need to go around at any point, and it could happen very late in the process, uh, in particular down in those last few feet entering into the flare. For this approach I want to demonstrate uh, just how impressive the Airbus is at landing even without both autopilots that sort of thing. So at the moment we have no DH ridden because as we said we're doing this uh, Cat 3B approach with 75 meters RBR. But what's going to happen if we have a failure? So at this time I'm going to load up a failure on final approach and then we'll see how the aircraft reacts. So we're going to set up the approach uh, just as we did before and then uh, as we get lower I'm going to activate a failure and we'll see how the airplane behaves. So as we can see, we are now fully configured on final approach, CAT3 dual, close-up localizer active, nothing wrong on the status page. So now let's go and activate a fault. So I'm going to go open ISCS, add new faults, and I'm going to go auto flight. I'm going to fail FAC1, and I'm going to do that now. 
So let's apply. And there we go, there's our master caution. So we've dealt with that in a previous video, managing uh, failures in the aircraft and so on. Um, and what you would do is obviously do your flying first. So we're still flying, the aircraft's still capable, it's in normal law, following the RLS down. But as you can see, it's actually reverted to Cat 3 single. So I'm not gonna do the whole flying scenario this time, I'm just gonna show you what the aircraft actually is doing and what it's capable of. So we Cat 3 single still, so it will auto land, but we can no longer do a no decision height auto land. So we need to change our minima now because we are Cat 3A only. So let's do that. So performance page, minima. Now we're gonna clear out the no, and we're gonna put in 50 because that is the minima there. So that works for Cat 3 single. Both autopilots are still engaged. And of course we need to do our ECAM. So fact one fault, if unsuccessful, fact one off. I think there was a reset there, but uh, anyway, so that goes off. And then we can clear auto flight. Let's just ding the cabin. And then we get a status page that tells us both PFDs are on the same fact. It's one of the flight control computers. Uh, Cat 3 single only. So we know that, and it tells us up here. So the Airbus is very clever. It does tell us all these things. In operative systems, CAT3 dual, so we can't do that, and obviously PAC1. So we'll get rid of that status page now, um, which you can normally do by pressing status, but in the TOTUS you had to press clear. Uh, and there we go. So now we are reconfigured for an auto land using CAT3 single. But as you can see, both autopilots are engaged, uh, but you, you can get all sorts of faults that will result in a CAT3 single, or maybe even CAT2 written up here. But we can still auto land uh, using the uh, as long as we know what equipment we actually need and like i say the airbus is very good at showing us that so let's see if it manages uh, successfully this time on final approach now and as you can see dh50 means we are required to see something and there's all different requirements about uh, lights whether it's three lights in a row or you need to have some sort of horizontal lights as well that sort of thing whether it's approach lights runway lights uh, but there we go land mode is engaged by 350 uh, we are already visual, so that's not a concern. We're just testing out to see whether it's going to auto land for us. Next, we're looking for flare, which should come by 30 feet out. And just as a reminder, rad out, of course, is down here. It's this little number here. You get a minima call out. Minimum. There's flare, thrust idle. It has flared. There's the call out, thrust levers to idle. There's touchdown, spoilers, bring up the reverses. And there's reverse green and decel, it is decelerating. And it's rolling out, so there you go, even though Cat 3 single. Now, again, that scenario there, that's not necessarily how you would do it in real life, it's just to show you that with a failure, of even one of the flight control computers on final approach, the Airbus is able to work out what sort of capability it has and then tell you and you can reconfigure uh, if you have time and so on and it's sensible to do so. That's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been of interest to you. I understand that this is a very long video. As I've said a few times, it is a really big topic. It's amazing the amount of extra training, qualifications and equipment that are required to get the flight to land safely when it's just those last few feet we're talking about here uh, but of course hopefully this has shown you why that might be and when you're flying out in the real world and you get delays because of fog um, this may give you some extra idea as to how that's causing the delays you can't of course have aircraft flying as close to each other as normal in this sort of situation you need extra time for them to be clear of the runway we talked about how you need to have space between aircraft in low visibility procedures because they would interfere with the ILS signal for each other things like that I would of course be doing more videos in the TOLIS in X-Plane 11 as well as some more Microsoft Flight Simulator videos so we've got both of those to come in the near future um, I hope this has been of interest to those of you new to the channel as well. We've had a huge growth recently, so thank you all for subscribing and coming along and joining us. And uh, I will be running both simulators in parallel. We'll be exploring different parts of the Airbus through both of them. As I said, more videos to come, more live streams to come soon, I hope as well. So thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again in another video very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.